I want to bring in my panel, Mike Leon, host of the Can We Please Talk podcast, CNN political analyst Laura Barone-Lopez, and CNN contributor Jane Coaston, and political commentator Kristen Soltis-Anderson. Okay, call me maybe cynical in this world, but whenever I see somebody defend another in a context like this, I have to wonder, is, does Chris Christie defending Nikki Haley, does that help Nikki Haley? Does that help Chris Christie? What was the goal? I think it felt like a genuine moment. The, the, the optimist on the table. <laughs> maybe, maybe, <laughs> I'm, maybe I'm very nice. Maybe oh, I'm naive. Wait, wait, you do, wait till you get to me. Okay, okay. so. Okay. <laughs> Look, sure, maybe, of course. Uh, there's always motives behind any moment like that. It did feel a bit genuine, though. He has known her, as he said, for a long time. And clearly, he was very frustrated by Vivek Ramaswamy and what he felt like were unjustified attacks and someone who, uh, like he said, has not always voted consistently in election cycles, has not voted consistently in a Republican primary and is now trying to run for the presidency. So, uh, you know, whether or not, look, they are all running for second place right now. This is not... They're not uh, anywhere near. They're double digits behind the front runner right now. So this is not going to make some substantial impact in Chris right. Christie's ability. To These are four right. people who all have something in common with all of us, which is that they're not going to be president right. of the United States. <laughs> right. But I think it was also a moment in which you saw a clear divide in who people were trying to talk to. Vivek Ramaswamy is not a populist. He's online. He is talking to an online mm -hmm. audience that uses words like based and responded to his great replacement theory mentioned by getting super excited that someone said it, someone brought it on. He's not talking about industrial policy. He's not talking about the working poor. He's talking to an online audience. Chris Christie and Nikki Haley are at least talking to people who are not online, people who respect them for having gubernatorial experience. And I think that that was a moment of solidarity looking at someone who is representative of a non-real coalition. Yeah, right. but then where's the party going? I mean, is it the anti-establishment? Is it the online? Is it the people who would be receptive to what Haley and Christie said? What do well, you think? Well, first off, it's ladies' night here. I don't know how I got into the studio. So <laughs> that's first. But um, Laura was just mentioning this, and, and Jane, too, as well, about second place. I felt like I was watching an NBA preseason game. Mm. Star is not playing in the game. I've got some backups. I've got some subs in there. I've got a rookie who doesn't know anything in Vivek. And he clearly showed that throughout this entire debate. And by the way, in the preseason analogy, I'm waiting for the regular season, which is January 15th and the IR primary, because Vivek, to me, tonight, showed that he did not understand how private companies work in the technology space with law enforcement. You know this, Laura, better than anybody. He showed to me that you don't know what people do after they leave public office, which is they either join TV, they write a book, they teach at a, at a law school or a professor or something like that. Like, he had no basic understanding of what people do after they leave D.C., and if, for him to attack Nikki Haley for some of these boards that she's been on, there was a Washington Post article about how transparent she's been with the money that she's gotten, and she's disclosed all of this stuff. So I, I thought that Christie stood up for her. I like that he did that. Christie had a bunch of tepid responses from the crowd, if you heard, when he called Trump the dictator and people were booing him in the, in the crowd. Oh, they're all playing for second place. We're all watching something that I don't know if it means anything. And I want it to mean something. And Kristen, I think you want it well, to mean something as and well. And the shame of it all, of it feeling like they're all fighting for second place, is there were moments where actually there, it was about 90 minutes in, Ron DeSantis had this relatively incisive sort of explanation of why me and why not Donald Trump. And in Nikki Haley's closing remarks, she had a great case for why me and why not Donald Trump. The problem is, that was the first question they were asked. Right. They could have got that out in the first five minutes of that debate, and instead they waited for the last quarter of it, it when people had already tuned out. And this needed to have been the message they were yeah. delivering from day one with strength, because at this point, you're, you've almost run out of time. Not I who's, a, your, not who's your favorite president. Yeah, I got to quote Talladega Nights, because yeah. why not? Yeah. Um, there's that famous singing where he says, you know what second place is? The first to lose. Yeah, right. And that was my accent putting it in as well. But there is a second <laughs> place you're talking about politics. There's a vice presidency. Are you suggesting that Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, Chris Christie, or Ron Tennis are vying to be the vice president? Because I can tell you, part of them will never be. I don't know who might be. I think half of them on the stage, DeSantis and Ramaswamy, would be more likely to potentially be Trump's vice president. Nikki Haley has maybe not so much at this debate, 
but in prior debates has very directly gone after Trump, has called him the most unpopular politician in America. He and Chris calls Christie, her bird brain in right. response. And Chris Christie has, <laughs> at this debate and at, all, at the prior debates, made very clear that he is no longer in line with the Republican Party that has been molded under Trump, has called him a liar, has called him a dictator tonight, mm -hmm. has said that he is a threat to this country and to the Constitution. So, no, I think maybe two out of the four on that stage might be looking at a VP place. So what's the value of second place? I mean, I, I think the value of second place is that we all know who these people are. We all know Vivek Ramaswamy. We all know who this person is. And but I, I just keep being struck by how much the Republican Party has changed in that it has been a contest from Vivek and from DeSantis and from others to sound like Trump, but better than Trump, but still like Trump, because everybody likes Trump. But why can't Trump be president if everyone likes Trump? It's this mm. endless question that they seem unable to answer, that if you want to sound like Trump and you think that Trump was a great president, then why shouldn't they just vote for him? It's like trying to explain why you want caffeine-free Coke. <laughs> no one wants caffeine-free Coke. And, and you know, to that point, uh, on our latest episode, Can We Please Talk Podcast, you check it out wherever you get your pods. Um, I have to throw that well, in. Well, you have caffeinated Coke that's available right. for people yeah, as well. Yeah. Go no, ahead. we do some Coke Zero in there. There you go. Um, but we had a uh, Washington Post uh, national politics reporter, Sabrina Rodriguez, and both of us went to the third debate in Miami. I, I've got family members. I'm Cuban. I live around the Trump flags and uh, Let's Go Brandon t-shirts. And... You could tell from her reporting and what she did with voters and some of the stuff that I've done with just internal focus groups of my own family. Yeah, we like DeSantis, but, but Trump's here. He's not going anywhere. Oh, yeah, I could get convinced for Nikki Haley, but, but Trump's here. So they're all doing the, I could, I could. But it's Trump is still here. He's still here. He's still not going anywhere. And Mitch McConnell had a chance to wipe this all out. We all know. And he didn't do it. And now we're dealing with this. And it's way different than 2015. I disagree with Laura. I don't think any of these folks are vying for any cabinet positions or anything with Donald Trump because, uh, well, Vivek, maybe. maybe. Okay, fine. I'll give you half <laughs> like, of one. <laughs> I think he's already in the cabinet. Yeah, you know, I think he, I, I think he may be already sure. in the cabinet. Or he's at my the old employer down the street. You think DeSantis he wouldn't take a cabinet post? He would if he was offered one. But Ooh. Mm, So you think, oh, you think he would Ooh, grab that, that, was a, that was very defendant. There's somewhere, there's a blind, bet, the blind taste test somewhere in all of this. <laughs> Coke Zero, Dr. Pepper, regular Dr. Pepper. I don't know. It's coming around. So my panel is back with me right now. I want to take a step back because you heard what Harry had to say. You've got this one-two punch coming. You've got the presidential election and 300-something days away. You've got a slimming majority that's really almost obsolete in terms of majority now. They're going to have to toe the line to hold on to their place and also get a president in the Oval Office who is a Republican. Can they do it? So the irony is that we are in this enormously polarized moment, right, where we think that everybody is in either Camp Red or Camp Blue. And yet when Harry said that last little factoid there was so interesting and I think explains a lot about the angst that we are seeing as we head toward this presidential election, the idea that Republicans are not actually all unified or all in lockstep. And as we've seen over the last few weeks with the flare-ups around Israel versus Hamas, the, the Democrats are not all unified either that we have in our country, you could argue five, six different parties all living under the surface of this two-party system. And so that's how we're having these primaries where we're gonna wind up with this Trump-Biden rematch mm -hmm. that most Americans go, ugh, I can't believe this is who we're stuck with. But our system is such a strange fit for the incredible ideological diversity we actually have in this country. You know, I just want to mention one thing because echoed as you were saying that in my head is Representative Chip Roy a few weeks ago on the House floor yelling profusely, and we played it at the top of our show recently, about give me one thing that we have passed legislatively that I can take back to my district. We all remember that. And if you think about that, that soundbite is resonating. There's 26 seats that are potentially in play. But Mike Lawler has mentioned this a bunch to Manu Raju and other congressional folks. He's like, hey, I'm in a swing district. Like, I got to go back. This is why he voted for the Santos expulsion. He's like, I, I have to go back. What am I taking back to them? Harry's piece just showed there 22 pieces of legislation, the lowest amount. Again, what are we taking back? And this is why maybe the debate 
matters a little bit because this is going to have a trickle effect down ballot. Well, you know, some people are actually taking back the district themselves, like Kevin yeah. McCarthy, who is saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm out at the end of the year. And there are other, you know, McHenry's out now as well. I mean, the, the, the majority is slimming, but not just people who are sort of the unknown. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are very consequential figures in Washington, D.C. This says a lot. And what's stunning is they are in the majority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, they have the majority in the House. And normally, the party that's in the majority doesn't see this many people saying, I'm going to pack it in, I'm going to resign, I'm not going to actually finish my full term. But look, McCarthy is upset that he got ousted, and I think that this speaks to what we've seen since he became speaker and then was subsequently ousted, which is, and you hear it from Republicans, House Republicans, over and over again, which is that they say that they're not governable and that they're not interested in governing. And I think that they have demonstrated that this year with their inability to pass any type of, or unwillingness to even want to get on board and pass bipartisan bills. And when some of them do, then they decide to oust their speaker. McCarthy was oust because he put a bill on the floor that got bipartisan support. And uh, now Everybody we see their pearls. <laughs> right. that, that was like the biggest, the worst thing in the world. Right. It got more Democratic support than Republican support, but did get a significant number of Republicans, and he got ousted for that. And now we may not even be able to see any type of national security supplemental package reach the floor that would send more money to Ukraine or to Israel or even to border security because Republicans can't come to a consensus on this. Right. When I, when I spoke with Representative Don Bacon, he compared members of his own party to the Know Nothings party of the 1840s. Mm. These are people he is supposed to be working with. He's talking about how when he sees Matt Gates, he avoids him. He doesn't want to talk to him. Again, these are people who are supposedly, per your point, they are technically in the same party and they are not able to get along on anything, especially because I think that they have become so stuck on the idea of politics is the point. Politics is actually not the point of what they do. Politics is how they get it done, but they are supposed to be governing. But there are a lot of people who are part of this caucus who don't want to govern. They want to get a lot of attention. They want to get on TV. They want you to know their names, but they don't actually care if anything gets passed. And then you have a bunch of representatives who we don't know their names, who are in swing districts, who are like, hey, my district is asking, hey, can we get some like flood insurance? Can we do Ooh, something right. about infrastructure? Can we do something about actual issues? And they're like, haha, no, no, we can't. We can't get anything done in this Congress. Because the attention economy, as you mentioned, a really important point. Everyone stick around. I've loved having this conversation with all of you, particularly tonight. Donald Trump may not have attended the debate, but he'll attend a court trial tomorrow. That's next.